Hello, everyone. So this is uh, part two of lecture two, safety in phlebotomy. Hello, everyone. So this is uh, part two of lecture two, safety in phlebotomy. Okay, so the learning objectives for uh, this topic are the following. So at the end of this lecture, the student should be able to describe proper donning and doffing of the PPE that we use in the laboratory to explain the different isolation techniques, to identify hazards and warning symbols, and to create actions to take if ever the given incidents occur in the laboratory. And finally, to be able to explain the importance of uh, following safety guidelines. So for, uh, to continue, rather, to continue what we have finished from part one, you know, we ended with hand washing. So for this topic, we will begin with PPE or personal protective equipment. Okay, so this includes uh, the disposable hoods, uh, disposable gowns, masks, gloves, eye gear or face shields, and uh, booties or shoe cover. Okay, So personal protective equipment is very important because it will protect the phlebotomist from infectious material from getting into his or her clothes, on his or her skin, and mucous membranes. Okay, So the employers should be able to provide this equipment for free okay? and should be able to maintain its supply and clean no, other equipment at no charge at all to the phlebotomist. Okay? So let's start with the gloves. Okay? So why do we have to use gloves in the laboratory? Okay? So there are technically three reasons why gloves should be worn in the lab. Okay? So first, it would help us prevent healthcare associates from uh, transmitting their own microflora to the patient. It would be also, a good way to prevent transmission of microorganisms from one patient to another. And lastly, to prevent the associate or the phlebotomist from becoming infected with whatever is infecting the patient. Okay. Now, for the mask, okay, so we use this to prevent transmission of infectious agents through the air. So there are several types of masks, as you have probably seen and worn. Okay, so we have the paper mask, which is the most uh, economical and efficient. And then we have the fluid proof mask, which is available for work conditions, especially when splattering of uh, body fluids or blood is likely to occur. Okay, and remember to use your mask around, you know, uh, it should be worn up, to cover the nose and the mouth, and it should not be worn around the neck, okay? And then it is effective only if it uh, remains dry. Now, once the mask becomes moist from breathing, uh, you'll need to have it changed, okay, into a fresh one, okay? These are the steps for donning. Okay, so um, to summarize what you have seen in the previous video, um, to don your PPE, you have to practice hand hygiene, you know, whether you use soap and water or you use alcohol-based uh, sanitizers. You know? Then you put on your gowns and then your mask and then your uh, eye, eye gear or goggles, and then the last Okay, pasensya. May technical difficulty tayo. Okay, so to continue with this uh, donning and doffing uh, video, no? so let's watch. These are the steps for donning and doffing PPE. If at any time you feel that you have made an error, please use hand hygiene between any of the steps or wash any area that has been mistakenly exposed. 
When donning PPE, begin by checking which PPE is required by reviewing the signage outside the room. To reduce risk of transmission, ensure hair is pulled back and jewelry is removed or minimized. For enhanced airborne droplet contact precautions, start by performing hand hygiene for 15 to 20, 20 seconds. Rub palms, wrists, in between fingers and thumbs, back of hands, and along the nail beds. Alcohol-based sanitizer is the preferred method. Use soap and water when hands are visibly soiled. Don your gown by first closing the back of the neck. Tie the waist, ensuring all clothing is covered. Place your fit-tested N95 mask over your nose and under your chin. Place the top strap at the crown of your head. Stretch the bottom strap over your head to the back of your neck. Mold the nose strip to ensure a secure fit and tight seal. Without touching the mask, perform a seal check by placing your hands at the top and bottom while taking deep breaths to feel if any air escapes. If air is felt, readjust mask for proper seal. Don face shield by placing strap at the back of the head, ensuring the shield is resting in the middle of your forehead. Put on gloves one at a time, making sure they are snug over your gown and no skin is exposed. When entering a negative pressure room, ensure each door is securely closed behind you. When doffing your PPE, step into the ante room, ensuring the door is closed behind you. Remove the first glove by pulling it up and away from the middle of your palm, ensuring no skin contact. Hold glove in the other hand. To remove the second glove, place a finger inside the clean area of the glove and push it off, balling up both gloves together. Throw into the garbage. Remove your gown by first opening at the neck and then at the waist. From the back of the neck, take the gown and slowly pull it out and away from you. Ensure you are only touching the inside of the gown as you roll into a ball and then throw into the garbage. Perform hand hygiene for 15 to 20 seconds. Remove the face shield by leaning forward, pulling the strap forward and away from you. Place into the garbage. Remove N95 mask without touching the exterior part of the mask. Again, pull it forward and away from you by starting with the bottom strap and then the top. Place it into the garbage. Perform hand hygiene again. For droplet contact precautions, a procedure mask is required. Follow the same donning procedure for the hand hygiene, gowning, and glove placement. For the procedure mask, place elastics around ears, Form to the bridge of the nose and pull under the chin. Follow the same doffing procedures by removing gloves one at a time using the glove to glove, skin to skin technique. Remove your gown by opening at the neck and then the waist. From the back of the neck, take the gown and slowly pull it out and away from you. Ensure you are only touching the inside of the gown as you roll into a ball and then place into garbage. Perform hand hygiene. When doffing a procedure mask, carefully remove straps from ears and pull forward and away from your face and body. Perform hand hygiene again. Okay. So note, no? Parang every point, kailangan merong hand hygiene. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, so to, to summarize what you have seen in the previous video, um, to don your PPE, you have to practice hand hygiene, whether you use soap and water or you use alcohol-based uh, sanitizers. No? Then you put on your gowns and then your mask and then your uh, eye, eye gear no? or goggles. And then the last PPE to be done would be your gloves, okay? 
And then when you need to doff or remove your PPE, the first thing to go would be your gloves and then your gown and then your eye shield or your face shield or your uh, goggles and then your mask. And then of course, at the end, practice hand hygiene. Okay, so to continue, isolation techniques. No? So we have already discussed this partially when we did the part one. So isolation techniques are in place to break the link at the transmission point, okay? So by isolating the patient, you'll be able to limit okay, the transmission of uh, the infectious agent to the next host, no? So, uh, the contact time a patient has to spread the infection is limited by isolation techniques, okay? So uh, isolation may be done in three ways, okay? We have the category-specific isolation, disease-specific isolation, and transmission-based isolation. Now, moving on to or to talk about it, no, about uh, isolation in depth. Okay, so let's check out each of those mentioned types of isolation. So for category specific isolation, this would include what we have discussed previously, you know, source and reverse isolation. So when you talk about strict isolation, you know, so this is for patients with contagious, uh, contagious diseases like chickenpox, diphtheria, or pneumonia. So this is also known as source isolation. Okay? Now, contact isolation are for diseases that are transmitted through direct contact with a patient, such as uh, scabies, okay, or kuto, okay. Um, respiratory isolation are given to patients with diseases that are transmitted through air, such as mumps, pertussis, or rubella, because the mode of transmission for these infections are through the respiratory tract, okay. For tuberculosis isolation, of course, this is the type of isolation specifically given for patients with TB. Now, for drainage or secretion precautions, sometimes we also call this uh, wound and skin precautions. These are given for patients with open wounds, which are usually the result of abrasions or accidental skin cuts, uh, surgery incisions, or bed sores that have become infected. Okay. Now, for enteric precautions, okay, these are for patients with uh, severe diarrhea due to bacteria like uh, Salmonella, no, uh, Shigella, or Vibrio cholerae. Okay, and then of course the protective or reverse isolation. So, uh, these are given to uh, patients who are easily affected by. Uh, the infectious agent. So this is done to protect the patient from whatever is being carried by uh, the healthcare workers. Okay. Then disease-specific isolation. So this was actually established uh, in 1983. Okay. So in order to overcome uh, the issues in category specific isolation. So this was created based on the modes of transmission of common diseases, okay? And the requirements of the categories were modified. And then a new category was added, which was the blood and body fluid precautions, okay? So uh, tuberculosis isolation was also updated to recommend the use of a private room with negative air pressure, as well as HEPA filter respirators, instead of just using surgical mask. And then lastly, okay, the transmission-based uh, precautions. These are actually isolation guidelines. So, uh, they were created and then they were revised last 1996. And it was intended for patients who are diagnosed with or suspected of having a specific transmissible disease. Now, there are three categories for uh, transmission-based uh, precautions. So we have the airborne precaution. These are given for patients known or suspected to have illness that are transmitted through uh, small particle airborne droplets around five micrometer or less, okay, which may be uh, suspended in the air. 
a droplet precaution or those uh, droplets that may be larger than five micrometer containing microorganisms. So these are given uh, to patients no, na pwedeng mag-aspirate ng mga droplets. And of course, contact precaution okay, if the infection can be acquired through direct or indirect contact. Okay, so this is these are examples of the uh, warnings no, that are posted on doors of patients. Okay, so we have contact precaution. So it says there that the visitor should refer uh, report first to the nurse ward before entering. And then we also have airborne precautions and droplet precautions. Still, it starts with uh, saying that visitors should report first to the uh, nurse ward before entering the room. Okay, so that's for our safety or the visitor safety. So uh, they should be able to read that before entering the room. Okay, now what about OSHA or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Standards? Okay, so uh, this agency investigates the possibility of unsafe practices in the work environment. Okay, their main goal is to promote safety for healthcare workers as well as their environment. Okay, so uh, they have several functions. This include to develop and promote health and safety standards for all occupations, to develop and issue regulations, to determine the level of compliance with health and safety regulations, and to provide fines for non-compliance with health and safety regulations. So, yeah. so they actually arrange how much an uh, institution needs to pay if, for example, a particular regulation was violated. Okay. So to better understand safety in phlebotomy, one must understand uh, the definitions that were set by OSHA. So uh, these are some of those definitions. Okay? So one, exposure incident. What does this mean? Okay? It's an exposure that can include non-intact skin, which consists of skin with dermatitis, okay? skin with cuts, skin with abrasions, or chafing, or acne, and so on, okay? Now, for exposure control plan, okay, so uh, this requires the employer to identify the task and procedures in which occupational exposure may occur, and to be able to identify um, who among the employees in the laboratory are responsible for performing those tasks, okay? And then they have the needless systems, okay? So these systems are used for collection of body fluids after initial venous or arter arterial access is established. So it does not mean that everything is needless. So uh, this refers to system after okay, the dextrose has been administered. Okay, so after the dextrose is already put in place. Okay, so there are uh, structures no, that are needless. No, you don't need to puncture the patient's skin anymore. Okay, so we limit okay, the pain that the patients would uh, experience. So if you notice or if you remember or recall, uh, you dextrose hose, okay? So there's a portion in the dextrose hose called uh, medicine port, okay? That's where uh, the nurses would inject, okay, uh, the syringe that would carry, uh, that would contain uh, medicines instead of... Uh, puncturing the patient's skin, they would just puncture a portion of the dextrose hose okay, to allow the um, medicine to be administered to the patient. Okay, So it's for uh, administration of medication or fluid. Okay? Okay, so surface contamination. So for surface contamination, we use 
uh, one is to 10 bleach solution, or you can use other disinfectant as long as it's approved by the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency. If you're going to use bleach, remember that they should be you know, ideally prepared daily. Okay? And then cleaning must take place at the end of each shift or whenever a surface is visibly contaminated. And whenever you clean, always make sure to wear your gloves. Okay, now moving on to hazards identification. Okay, for hazards identification, this would refer to symbols or labels uh, indicating warning. Okay, so uh, biohazards no, or biological hazards okay, uh, has been identified by CDC and OSHA and it's included in universal precautions. So this would include all blood samples and other body fluids Okay. Uh, they should be collected, transported, and processed using strict precautions. Always use PPE and always practice hand washing. Okay. So usually the biohazards are the agents of occupational exposure. Okay. That's why extra care is given to disposing them. Okay, so they are usually considered medical waste. Okay, so these biohazards are medical waste. Okay, and they are uh, carriers or uh, vehicles of infectious agents. Okay, so contaminated needles and other contaminated sharps should not be transported, recapped, bent, cut, broken, or removed from the uh, standard container. Okay, so there's a specific container for sharps. They're usually puncture resistant, leak proof, and of course they are usually labeled and they have that biohazard sign or label, okay? just like what you see in this slide. Okay, moving on to another hazard, the fire hazards. Okay, so fire is usually caused by the breakdown and recombination of molecules from materials that's burning. Okay, as long as there's oxygen, uh, they would continue to burn. Okay, so usually uh, there are materials inside the laboratory that may be fire hazards, you know, that may be considered as fire hazards, like uh, wires that are left open, overheated machines, uh, chemicals, okay, so uh, lamps, alcohol lamps, okay? so uninhibited reactions when chemicals are mixed, so those are uh, obvious causes of fires, okay, so all laboratories are required to have uh, fire extinguishers. Okay, so every uh, all the labs have fire extinguishers. Now, in case of fire, uh, we need to remember these acronyms. So first, we have the race. Okay, so R for rescue. Try and rescue anybody within your line of vision, and then if you can, okay rescue someone and then ring the alarm okay if you can try and contain the fire if it's just in a single room try and close that door get out of the room of course and close that door okay if you can extinguish it if not evacuate okay so that's race so most importantly try and remain calm okay now to operate uh the fire extinguisher remember the acronym PASS, okay? So PASS, P for pull the pin, A, aim the nozzle towards the source of fire, S, squeeze the trigger, and the last S, sweep the nozzle, the nozzle okay? To make sure that you cover uh, the basis you know, or the source of the fire, okay? Of course, there are different types of um fire extinguishers and so we have a uh, class a class b class c class d class k it depends on uh what type of or what uh the, it depends on the source of the fire okay so moving on 
electrical hazards. Okay, so marami din tayo nito sa lab. Okay, so the hazards to look for are frayed cords. Okay, so that could spark okay, and cause fire or it could electrocute a uh, phlebotomist. Okay, so sometimes no, uh, plugs without grounding prong can become electrical hazards as well. So it's in ground prong. Okay, so sometimes we have this. Okay? the third wheel that should not be removed because it's the ground it would uh that's where um problematic electric current should go i believe okay so that should not be removed okay and then what else okay? also watch out for any type of shock when the equipment is used so from time to time, the, the phlebotomist okay, and those who work inside the lab are exposed to electrical hazards okay, because there are a lot of electrical equipment inside the laboratory. So if you find any frayed cords, you know, ask your maintenance to work on that to keep you safe while you're working in the laboratory. Okay, next, chemical hazards. Okay, so there are a lot of chemicals in the laboratory, and employees must be notified of the potential health hazards of the chemicals that they handle. Okay, how can this be done? By making sure that there is the MSDS in the laboratory or the material safety data sheet. So what's in that sheet? Okay, so it contains the product identity, it contains the hazardous ingredients, the physical data, uh, fire and explosion hazard, reactivity data, health hazard, precautions for safe handling and use, and of course, control measures. Okay. So this is the NFPA or the National Fire Protection Association uh, Hazard Identification System label. Okay, so uh, this portion here, this uh, diamond portion is blank usually. They just have the colors blue for health hazard, four for fire hazard, yellow for reactivity hazard, and white for specific hazards. So that should be filled in. Okay, it depends on the chemical. Okay, so for the blue, say it's number two, so it's hazardous. Okay, it's a health hazard. For the red portion, it's number four, so that's a uh, able to ignite. You no, know, at what's that? Seventy-three degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so the flash point would refer to the lowest temper temperature at which a particular chemical would ignite. Okay, so uh, the chemical to which this table belongs is at number four. So uh, it's able to ignite at 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and for the yellow for reactivity, it's number one, unstable if heated. And lastly, for the white one, specific hazard, it's an acid. Okay, so you'll know that the chemical no, on which this sticker was uh, put on is an acid, acid, it's hazardous, it can ignite at 73 degrees Fahrenheit, and it is unstable if heated. So that's the characteristic of the chemical uh, that this tag belongs to. Okay, so to be able to understand that further, and so you can pause the video and take a picture of this uh, so this is basically the explanation of the previous symbol, okay? So how to understand that. So the definition of each number is placed here, okay? So when it's zero, there's technically no problem. When it's four, okay, high risk. Uh, okay, so this is an example of a label. Okay, a chemical label. So you have there, number one, statement of the hazard. It's a dangerous material, okay? And the hazard class, it's flammable, okay? Number three, safety precautions is placed here, okay? And then number four, it's NFPA 
uh, hazard code. No? It's a it's a one a three and a zero, and then five. The type of fire extinguisher is B, okay, and then uh, it would require a class B fire extinguisher, and then what else? Number six, safety precautions. Number seven, uh, chemical formula or formula weight. And then lot number there. Okay? So this is the characteristic of the methyl alcohol. Okay? So you can find that in the labels. Okay? So learn to read labels. Okay? Next, radiation exposure. Okay, so the principles involved in radiation exposure are distance, shielding, and time. Okay, so the amount of radiation you're exposed to depends upon how far you are from the source of ra uh, radioactivity or what protection you have from it and how long you were exposed to it. Okay, now monitoring devices for exposure should be worn you know, to detect exposure to radioactivity if the phlebotomist is collecting frequently from patients treated with uh, radioactive implants or those returning from uh, nuclear medicine scans. Okay. And then we have latex allergy. Okay, latex is a material made from uh, natural rubber, you know? and it can be found in gloves, tourniquet, uh, blood pressure cuffs, IV tubing, and even bandages. Okay, so since phlebotomists are constantly exposed to latex in the gloves that we use, okay, so they are at high risk. Okay, so. Uh, reactions to latex can vary from individual to individual, okay? So it could be itchy irritations to redness and swelling, blistering to uh, urticaria, you know? So symptoms may begin as early as 24, uh, as early as uh, two to three hours, you know? and then there's 24 to 48 hours, and then there are some, you know, uh, where symptoms appear after several days, okay? Now, the type 1 latex allergy is quite serious, okay? So this is type 1, okay? So it's characterized by the presence of urticaria or wheels, large raised rashes, okay? So the reaction is quite immediate, sometimes uh, it can be seen within minutes of exposure. The second type is delayed hypersensitivity or contact dermatitis. It's type 4. Okay, so type 4 contact dermatitis is characterized by popular pruritic uh, rashes. Sometimes there's vesicles and blisters like this. No? There are obvious blisters and uh, it looks so itchy. Okay, so the cause is the chemicals in the latex. Uh, they might have been uh, absorbed in the skin. So the reaction can be seen usually uh, several hours to about 48 hours after contact. Okay, and then the last type is the non-immune or the irritant contact dermatitis, okay? So it's characterized by dry, cracked, irritated skin, okay? So this is also caused by the chemicals in the latex. Now, sometimes hand washing, okay? Constant hand washing can also cause that, okay? So the time of onset is quite gradual. You now they can occur over several days. Okay. Then, of course, we have disposal of used materials. So there are technically uh, two requirements. Okay. So one is to alter the product so that no one can remove used needles or syringes or other devices from their own personal for their own personal use or uh, be endured by any exposure. Okay. So alter the product. Number two. Uh, waste must be rendered non-infectious so that people handling the waste will not become infected and that the environment will not be contaminated as well. Okay, so altering the product and uh, 
to render it non-infectious by uh, several methods. Okay, so three common methods are incineration, chemical treatment, and autoclaving. Okay, now incineration is where the waste is burned to ash, and then the ash is taken to the disposal area. Yeah, and this is incineration. Okay, so this method kills any potentially infectious organism and makes the items within the waste non-usable. Okay? Now, if a healthcare institution does not have its own incinerator uh, that meets the environmental standard, so it can be uh, disposed by a commercial medical waste handler. Okay. Now, for chemical treatment, and no, so chemical treatment consists of grinding or chopping the waste into small pellets and then treating the pellets with disinfectant chemical to kill any infectious uh, microorganisms or to simply submerge okay, used materials into solution of uh, diluted bleach. Okay, so then we have the autoclave. Okay, so the autoclave is actually the uh, perfect type of decontamination. Okay, so uh, you can use this for a small operation where only small amounts of waste is generated. Okay, so the waste material is placed inside the autoclave and then it will be uh, processed okay, for about an hour, but the actual autoclaving is only 15 minutes. Okay, the temperature required is 121 degrees Celsius under pressure. Okay, so 15 pounds per square inch. Okay, so 15 minutes, 15 pounds per square inch. Okay. So the importance of following safety guidelines. Okay, so uh, it's actually twofold. Okay, so. Uh, following safety guidelines is for our safety and for the safety of our patients as well okay now if the infrastructure of your laboratory or your workplace does not follow uh, the osha uh, guidelines and it was found out during an osha inspection expect that you'll be given a penalty or a fine you'll be required to pay fines if you do not follow the OSHA uh, guidelines, okay? Now, the most prevalent hazard for the phlebotomist is accidental needle sticks, okay? So, uh, as much as possible, we should use the uh, safety needles that were shown to you last uh, week, right? So, our response to accidental biohazard exposure should be as follows. Okay, so immediately wash the exposed area with soap and water. If the mouth area was exposed, rinse it with water or mouthwash. If the eyes were exposed, flush it with large amounts of warm water. Okay, and then of course, do not forget to report the incident to your uh, chief medic. Okay, and then uh, the exposed phlebotomist as well as the source patient must be tested, especially if uh, you are expecting that the patient is positive for HIV or HEPA B. Okay, but uh, make sure that both parties give consent. Okay, now if in the event the source patient refuses to be tested and then you know that he or she is a high-risk patient no? or positive for HIV or HBV, no? the phlebotomist may elect to receive prophylactic treatment. Okay, So all exposed phlebotomists or lab employees are counseled to be alert for viral symptoms for about 12 weeks after exposure. Okay. And that ends our second topic, safety in phlebotomy. So remember, safety first. No? The safe way is the best way.